Good morning. This is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. My chickens say good morning as well as they're all laying eggs. Um, hope you all are enjoying the cool snap here in Portland, Oregon in Zone 8B. It um, is a nice break from the fabulous sunny weather we've been having. This cool, rainy, overcast weather is perfect for planting. It's low stress for those perennials that you want to get in the ground right now. They have a chance to have sufficient moisture put into their roots and a chance to recover from the shock of transplanting without the bright rays of the sun beating down on them. So this is a great time to be out transplanting plants, even if we're all missing the sunshine and um, the warm weather and uh, feeling like spring had finally arrived. This, um, <clears throat> whatever they call it, fool's spring, I guess, when we get this last wave of cool weather, perfect for planting out things. I have been working the last several days on spreading 12 yards of leaf mold. This crow does not like that I'm out here. She's giving me a hard time. So Portland City Parks has a program and the city has a program where they collect all of the leaves and compost them. And then the week of Earth Day, you can get as much as you want for free. The rest of the year, I think it's like $30 a yard. You can go pick it up and buy it. But the week of Earth Day, free service that the city provides. I'm often leery of getting compost from material composted from yard waste bins because I feel like there's a high risk for contamination with um, pesticide material, herbicide material, and just like crap that doesn't really belong in a yard waste bin. But the composted leaves from Portland City Parks are relatively clean. There's some garbage in there. I'll be showing you um, what my, my load has looked like so far. But they don't spray the trees in the city. And most of us don't spray our maple trees and our, um, you know, our other trees that are along the streets in our, in our neighborhoods. And the, the parks don't spray the tree leaves. So it's a relatively clean material. And leaf mold is extremely good for your plants, particularly in a woodland garden where the natural way soil is built is by falling leaves accumulating on the woodland floor and molding and creating new biomass. So if you have a woodland shade garden, it's going to love that leaf mold, but anywhere in the garden well. Leaf mold is not going to burn your plants. It's not going to bind up nitrogen. It's very well composted. Sometimes it can be a little bit high in carbon. So just be aware that if you want to add a little bit of nitrogenous material when you're putting it down, that might be helpful. So I've been spreading that. You might, you might be asking me why I got 12 yards of it for my quarter acre garden. It's because uh, I have a minivan, so I can only go pick up small quantities at a time. But uh, in my gardening group, Someone had posted that there was a guy you could hire and he would bring you 12 yards in his big dump truck. So I was like, let's go for it. It ended up costing me less than $10 a yard. And he was willing to dump eight yards on my property and four yards on my dad's property one block away for one delivery fee. And since I do all of the gardening for my dad now, um, it was really great to have that material dropped there so that I could work on his beds. You might have seen one of my videos about putting down burlap. I was using that leaf mold. So I've been spreading some on my property and my dad's property as well. And I'm more than halfway through. So I thought I would just give you a little look at what my garden looks like right now and talk you through some of the ways that I think it's good to lay down leaf mold. After I show you the beds, I wanna talk about the permaculture concept of a closed system and why that concept may be an ideal, but it also may not be one you need to apply to your garden the way you think that you do or the way that other people tell you that you do. So I will come back at the end and talk about that. So please stay tuned all the way to the end if you're interested in permaculture and sustainable and regenerative ways of growing food and existing as a human being on this planet. It's really important to understand what a closed system is and how it works in various settings. So let me show you around the garden and I'll be back. So in my garden, it may seem a little odd to folks because in permaculture, we talk about zones and the things that you use most frequently, you keep up in your zones one and two near the house. I actually have my rain garden here 
which doesn't require much work. And beyond it, I have my veg patch, which used to be much more formal looking, but as time has gone on, I've let it get kind of wabi-sabi. As we run downhill, water from the rain garden comes and these paths function as swales, and I have these kidney bean-shaped beds that catch water. You can see I put in tons and tons and tons of this leaf mold. You can see my potatoes are coming up here. Some of my tree collards here. So with these beds, I used what whatever I had on hand for material to raise up my beds so that I could add even more biomass to them. You know, scotch bottles and logs that were too rotten to use as firewood. We had a sidewalk going through this property when we first bought it and because the property behind used to be an orchard here. And so I busted up that sidewalk and I used those bits of urbanite here for my beds. Now to add in way more biomass, these beds were already overflowing and I was having problems. It's, it's maybe a little bit difficult to see it in the context of this video, but these run downhill. And so I would have soil sloping off the back. So what I ended up doing was adding more, you can see here, there's actually four layers of urbanite. One is completely buried by this, this path here is very, very deep. And that's how it functions as a swale, very deep mulch. So there's one, two, three, four. I added a fourth layer on top here so that I could add another four inches of this leaf mold. Now, before I put the leaf mold down, I added azomite and rock dust minerals to increase the mineral content of my soil. You can soil. see some of my shallots here are coming up. The ones that were already sprouting when I brought them home from the Asian market are really getting going. Yes, I need to uncover them a tiny bit. The ones that hadn't sprouted in the bag are just now starting to come up. So you can see I've added all of this here. Now, I wasn't really expecting to have to add all of this leaf mold this spring. So it kind of, it's something that just came up, the opportunity presented itself and I took advantage of it. So it meant though that I had to pull back a lot of mulch. So all my beds had mulch. You can see here's an example. And I had to pull back the mulch to add the compost leaf mold. Now I could have left it it would function a little bit like a hugel bed as long as I was planting through the leaf mold, through the wood chips into the soil underneath. I don't think it would have bound up that much nitrogen and I don't think it would have been a problem, but I was trying to conserve my mulch and reuse it. Now a problem I have noticed is that I have a lot of, this is not a problem, it's a good problem. I have a lot of mycelium holding the bottom layer of wood chips to the ground itself. So it's impossible for me to scrape up all of it. Hello, Violet. Hello, Violet. It's impossible for me to scrape up all of the wood chips, but I'm pulling back as much as I can. I'm putting down the soil, the leaf mold, and then I'm gonna push back the wood chips. I'm also gonna order more wood chips because I don't like bare soil. That invites weed competition to move in. Nature abhors a vacuum, cover that soil, help keep it protected and help conserve your water by putting mulch on top. So that's gonna happen. So today I'm gonna to be planting beans here. I'm gonna be planting some runner beans here. And I am going to be doing my darndest to get the rest of the spread. Let me show you what I've got going on. So we walk by the rain garden. I don't know how I'm gonna spread it in here. Probably gonna put it directly on top of the mulch. Um, just because the mulch again is so held to the soil by all of the mycelium that I have going on. So I'll probably put the leaf mold here and then put the um, additional layer of wood chips on top after I order that. You can see my gumi berry, marion berry, quince. Underneath I have spread a bunch more of the leaf mold here and I actually used some logs to kind of help hold it up off the path. I did end up moving my Carolina allspice bush farther out because the Marion berry was kind of smothering it. So as long as I was building up this bed, I went ahead and moved her. Again, cool, overcast, drizzly, perfect time to be moving plants, transplanting them. Okay, my kids left their squirt guns out. This bed has constantly struggled with having very little soil and everything in it 
everything has a hard time up here. So I took some bricks and logs and I put in about four inches of the leaf mold. And you can see here, I added some geranium cuttings, more over there. And I built this up and then I pushed the mulch back because this bed really bakes in the summer. Oh, I also put in a couple of my tree collards here, purple tree collard. I will be able to tie them up to the wooden wire fence here and that will help keep them from falling over when they get big. I have most of the front yard to do, all of the woodland garden to do, and most of my perennial beds in the backyard still to do. So I think I'll be able to use this up. Okay, so let me show you what you can expect with this leaf mold. It looks really clean from here, but they are raking up leaves and composting them. So some detritus, some plastic garbage inevitably gets in because Americans are super obsessed with plastic and we create a ton of microplastic pollution. So there were little bits of who knows what, plastic utensils. I found broken up bits of pens. This is, I think, a tea bag. One of those synthetic tea bags. Why you would ever, oh, sorry for dirty gardening hands, y'all. Why you would ever use synthetic tea bags? I don't know. Um, dental floss. Uh, hypodermic needle caps and a couple pieces of broken glass. So please wear gloves when you are sifting through this. I have not found any syringes or needles at all. I think the two the two needle caps I found folks tend to chuck the needle cap on the ground and perhaps reuse the needle. So I've not found any evidence of syringes at all, but I have found toothbrush, a plastic fork, some wires, things like that. But I think that that's when you reuse an urban resource, it's going to be imperfect and there's going to be plastic pollution. That's just the reality. So let's go back and have a little conversation about why I feel okay importing all of this material onto my property and what permaculture has to say about closed systems. Okie doke, I'm back. Still chilly enough uh, that I'm wearing my old, dirty, holy wool gardening cardigan. It's my favorite because I don't have to worry about what it looks like and it keeps me really warm even when it's rainy outside here in Portland, which it is nine months out of the year. So what is a closed system? You've seen how my garden beds look right now. I didn't produce 12 yards of leaf mold on my property, but I'm using it. So in permaculture, a closed system is where you create everything you need and everything your property needs on site. And also you take the waste material and you find a way to use it or recycle it or compost it on your site and you don't ship it off. So a closed system is uh, basically think of like a biosphere, right? Everything is self-contained and that is a true mark of uh, sustainability, right? I don't need to import any products and I don't have to export my garbage. This is a permaculture ideal. And it's one that I see people put forth a lot. And I think that folks can get pretty bogged down with the notion of a closed system has to be your property. That may work if you're in an extremely rural area or you have 20, 50, 100, 800 acres, right? But for most of us, a closed system, we need to think beyond the limits of our property, beyond the borders of our property. I like to think of a closed system as a local economy, as my community around me, as my city of Portland. So for me, just like I think about the fact that I only have a quarter acre property and in permaculture, we have these gardening zones and zone five is complete wilderness, untouched wilderness, we don't bother. I might not have that on my property here, but I have it in my neighborhood and I have it in my city. The same way, when I look at a closed system, I am not physically able to produce enough biomass to regenerate my landscape in a human time scale all on this property. So I import wood chips. You've seen I import them several times a year. And every several years, I import compost or leaf mold. I also import things like food for my family. I don't have cows. We 
drink milk and uh, I like half and half in my coffee and we eat dairy. I purchase um, a quarter of a cow for our family of six. That is our year's supply of beef from a local grass-fed, grass-finished uh, cattle rancher in Washington State. So I am not an entirely closed system. We have flush toilets here. I would love to get to a place where we can use composting toilets, which technically aren't legal in the city of Portland, but I know a lot of people who un unhook their plumbing and make composting toilets. I have water brought into my property and I have a garbage pickup. Every other week, our family puts out a micro can of garbage. And every week we have recycling that goes out. So, oh, not to mention the fact that my spouse leaves our property and works off site to get us our health insurance and an income. And obviously I am importing um, seeds and plants all the time. I love to go to garden centers. I love to mail order uh, things that I can't get on my property that increase my sustainability, increase the diversity of food and plants on my property. And at the same time, I am exporting my knowledge about permaculture and my experience of permaculture to you all on the internet. So I'm clearly not a closed system. If you feel like you're struggling because you still make garbage and you still have to buy in things like compost or you have to get wood chips because you just don't have any topsoil. Now I compost a lot and I create a lot of biomass on site, but when I bought my property, I had zero topsoil. I mean, zero topsoil. It was just clay, subsoil and rocks. So in order to build up organic matter in a reasonable time scale for me to live on this property and produce much of my own food, I had to import things, wood chips, compost, leaf mold. So when you think about your closed system, think about expanding the borders of your closed system to include your community. When we have community interconnectedness, we increase our sustainability and our resilience. So I know a lot of people in permaculture want to be self-sufficient and they see having an open system where things come in and out as um, a negative. I don't. I see it as a real strength when we are able to have effective systems of utilizing a waste product like wood chips on our property that that is importing something to us but it is helping our entire community become a closed system it's helping the city of portland work toward being a closed system because i'm taking something that somebody else can't use and i'm making use of it within our city so if you have experiences of, of how a closed system works for you or how you conceptualize it uh, I'd love to hear about it in the comments, but I hope that encourages you to think about your property doesn't have to be a closed entity unto itself. You can think about your system as including your neighbors, as including your community, as including your local food economy, your local resources that are outside your specific property, but are still within 100 miles or um, the confines of your city, what have you. And I think that makes us a lot more resilient as a people and it makes permaculture much more approachable and much more realistic for most people. And if permaculture isn't approachable and realistic, folks aren't gonna do it. So let's make sure that it's accessible to everybody and just kind of expanding our, our concepts a little bit, widening our circle helps bring more people in to experience permaculture sustainability, resilience, and healing for the planet. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed a little bit of what my garden beds look like now. I am going to get back to shoveling and then today I will be planting bush beans and runner beans. So I'll have a video on that coming up, I hope. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe. It helps um, support my family and helps me keep making lots more videos. So thank you.